I'm atheist is the public face of evolution advocacy. We, we theistic evolutionists want to take over from the, atheist, from the atheists. We think you should let us be the leaders. He says that those who embrace theistic evolution should actively engage family, friends, uh, colleagues, clergy, elected officials, news reporters, and anyone else who evinces doubt about the compatibility of evolution and religious belief. To really protect education from creationism's inroads, it has to be marginalized, not just scientifically and legally, but theologically, and the atheists among us cannot do that. And so what he's saying is, you atheists, you, leave it to us, the compromisers, the theistic evolutionists. Let us lead the way so that we can convince people to add evolution evolution into the Bible. Here they are helping the atheist agenda. You know, you know, when you think about it, atheists won't compromise with the Christians. Oh, but they love the Christians compromising with them. And they use them for their own agenda to do what? To change that foundation in this nation, to change it from one built on the foundation of God's word to one built on man's word, from a Christian worldview to a secular worldview. It's an incredible spiritual battle in this nation between Christianity and secular humanism. And unfortunately, the church, by and large, is on the side of secular humanism. People, the church needs to repent. And you know, we look at the Israelites in Hosea. Uh, for instance, we read about the Israelites. Oh, they started worshipping wooden idols. They played the harlot against their God. And what did God say to them? I despise your feast days. I'm not going to accept your offerings. I'm not going to hear your, your singing, your praise songs. And he's withdrawn himself from them. He says, I'll send a famine in the land of hearing the words of the Lord. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And this is going to affect your children. You know, we look at the Israelites and say, how stupid could they be with all the great things God had done for them and all the miracles and they worship pagan gods? How could they do that? I want to say something here. We in the church in America, by and large, in our Western world, have done the same. When the church has taken the pagan religion of the day, and that's what it is. That's what evolution millions of years is. It's the pagan religion of the age to explain life without God, and we've added that into God's word. We have done exactly the same as what the Israelites have done. And you know, God's principles apply regardless. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And I believe what he says in Hosea 4, 6 applies. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. This is going to affect your children. What do we know? 70% of kids are, are going to walk away from the church. We're losing the coming generations. And we found, as we did that research that was published in Already Gone, we found uh, that these, these kids weren't being taught the word of God. In fact, over and over again, they said, we weren't taught to, to, to defend the faith. We weren't given those answers. There is a famine on the land. There's a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. The church is not teaching people how to answer the skeptical questions of the age, to be ready to give a defense for the Christian faith, to know why we believe what we do. And you know what I believe God is saying today to the church? I, I, and I don't see your, your assemblies. I don't savor your assemblies. You can have all your worship services. You can have all your programs and all your curricula. And you can have all your praise songs, but I don't hear them. You know why? Because you have compromised my word. And I believe that's where we're at in this, in this nation today. So what is wrong with the church? Biblical authority has been undermined because of compromise. And the church has also succumbed to this separation of church and state issue as a neutral position. And this is why the church has not been a force, because they haven't really understood the foundational change, haven't been, been thinking in the right way. And uh, the world has so affected their thinking, because we haven't, haven't been thinking biblically, uh, we've, we've succumbed to this idea of neutrality. You know, in Matthew 12.30, we read... He who is not with me is against me. If you don't gather, you scatter. That in James, friendship with the world is at war with God, enmity with God. In Romans, men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And also in Romans, the carnal mind is at war against God. We've got to remember something. There is no neutral position. You know, you imagine two knights fighting and one says, before we begin, throw down your sword. Oh, okay, that's a great idea. You say, well, that's stupid. Well, what about a Christian and a non-Christian talking? Now, we can talk about life and the universe, but you must leave the Bible out of it. Oh, okay, because that's where much of the church is. What is interesting to me is what a reporter said to me here at the museum when he said, what are you really on about in Answers and Genesis in the Creation Museum? What's your real underlying motive? And I said, we're on about the authority of the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ to see people saved, one to the Lord to be in heaven with us. And he looked at me and he said, so you admit it then? And I said... <laughs> Admit what? You admit that you're deliberately trying to get people saved. Absolutely. And then he said, that's refreshing. 
And I said, why is that? He said, because we interview a lot of people in America, whether it's with, uh, to do with the abortion issue or the gay rights issue, gay marriage issue, or to do with creation evolution in school issue, or the Ten Commandments issue, or nativity scenes issue, or whatever it is. And he said, we know a lot of them go to church and they're Christians, but when we ask them, what are you on about? The usual answer is tradition, family values, what's good for the culture, uh, what, what, you know, what, 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 um, what's right, and so on. He said, why don't they come right out and say, we're on about the Bible? Because we've been intimidated in this nation. The church has been intimidated. Because many people don't know how to answer sceptical questions anyway because the church hasn't taught that by and large. And we've been intimidated to think, oh, if we say we're on about the Bible, you're on about religion. You can't impose religion on this culture. And see, here's the problem. We have the secular world uh, challenging uh, the, the Christian world. And they say, oh, we, we can talk about all these issues, but you can't use the Bible. And so many in the Christian world say, oh, okay, so uh, I can give that up. That's all right. And I can walk on a neutral ground, but it's not neutral ground. It's their ground. And we've let them win the debate. And that's why a lot of times when we see the issue of abortion or gay marriage being dealt with in the Christian world, the arguments are conservative values, what's good for the culture, tradition, it's wrong, the founding fathers, what they believed. You know, Newsweek magazine in January 9 issue this year, 2010, had an article uh, about gay marriage and on the front cover it said the conservative case for gay marriage. And it had a conservative who wrote an article and he said this, the explanation mentioned most often is tradition, but simply because something has always been done a certain way does not mean that it must always remain that way. By the way, he's right. If it's just tradition, family values, what do you think is good for the culture? It's just an opinion and that's all it is. And here's the problem. I like to use these castle diagrams. On the right we have the foundation of God's word and the castle of Christianity and the gospel that comes out of that foundation. And on the left we have the foundation of autonomous human reasoning, in other words, man's word. And we have secular humanism and those issues, moral issues, gay marriage and so on. There's been a phenomenal attack on Christianity in our, in our day. There's been an attack on the word of God and particularly an attack on Genesis 1 to 11 and much of the church has succumbed to that attack and said, well, we don't need that. It doesn't matter. Uh, as, long as, as long as we keep the rest of the Bible and keep this structure, we'll be okay. But that structure needs a whole foundation to stand. And then we look up at those issues, abortion, gay marriage, and so on. And they say, here are the problems. We've got to go out there and fight the problems. People, they're not the problems. They're the symptoms. And, you know, for all the millions of dollars that Christians in America have spent fighting the abortion issue, the gay marriage issue, and so on, for all the millions of dollars spent fighting those moral issues, has it really worked? From a big picture perspective, has it? No, it hasn't. You know why not? Because we've gone out there to try to change the culture when what the secular world did was change hearts and minds that changed the culture. You see, the Bible says go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel and make disciples of, of people. You see, the point is, until hearts and minds are changed concerning the word of God, you're not going to change the culture. The secular world have known what to do. That's why they hate us influencing children. They know if we can take generations of kids through an education system, change their foundation, change their hearts and minds in regard to, to the word of God, and a compromising church lets it happen and says, that's okay, trust in Jesus, and then we wonder why their whole worldview changes and the culture changes. And if we want to be successful, what have we got to do? We've got to change hearts and minds. We've got to see hearts and minds change. It's God's word that changes hearts and minds. Hearts and minds changed in regard to the word of God who build a Christian worldview who will be that salt and light out there and not contaminated salt. In the same issue of Newsweek, the author made this statement. He said, the simple fact is there is no good reason why we should deny marriage to same-sex partners. Oh, yes, there is if the Bible really is the absolute authority of the word of God. That is the reason. And this is the way we should be fighting those issues, fighting the abortion issue, the gay marriage issue. Here's what the Bible says. It's the Bible that's the absolute authority. Here's what God's word says. But you see, the problem is when you have a church that compromises the word of God, doesn't really stand on the word of God, and we've been intimidated by thinking there's such a position as a neutral position, when in reality there's not, no wonder the church is not touching the culture. Romans 10 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's God's word that goes from his, forth from his mouth and shall not return unto him void. So I have a challenge. Who is on the Lord's side? Who is prepared to stand unashamedly on God's word in this nation? 
We need generations of people, God's people, to start standing unashamedly on the Word of God. 